Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Abbott's Group Training Corporate Wellbeing webinar, focusing on resilience. And our guest today is Stephen Harris, who's going to be talking for the next hour about resilience in the context of the work he does in the, um, the fire service, but also in the context of us as business professionals. Um, I'm going to be managing the chats and questions, so feel free to send in questions, which I will happily field with, uh, with Steve, and um, that will come later in the session. So the way that today is going to work is when I bring Steve on to speak to you, he will be talking for an hour, which will take us at about five past 11. And then we're going to open the floor to Q&A for about 10 minutes or so, which will take us you know, around quarter past 20 past 11. Then we're gonna have a comfort break for five minutes and then come back at around 25 past the hour. And there'll be about 20 minutes of uh, role practice between Claire, who a lot of you know, Claire is my uh, equal business partner at Abbott's Group Training. She's also my uh, life partner as well. So she's my boss, she keeps me under control. Um, so there's going to be some role practice between Claire and Steve to, I, I guess, put into practice what Steve is talking to you this morning about in theory. And then that will finish at around 20, well, about 22, 10 to midday, and then we'll have more time for Q&A. So without further ado, I would like to uh, bring on board um, an excellent uh, motivational speaker and resilience coach, Stephen Harris, who's had 29 years experience in the fire service, um, who is responsible for 1,200 plus firefighters, has an immediate team of 50 people under his charge, responsible for £4 million plus budget, um, and is now spending a lot of his time working with his team around resilience. So I'm going to turn my camera off and put myself on mute. And Steve, please, please take centre stage and 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 and, and uh, empower us with your with your knowledge and experience. Brilliant, thank you, Jeremy. If you could just give me a thumbs, I was just want to make sure you can definitely hear me. I assume you'd tell me if you couldn't. Uh, yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks. That's a, a startling introduction. That I've got to try and live up to. Um, so, yep, Steve Harris. Um, what Jeremy's just said is interesting because everything he just said about me, about the people I manage in that was true up until about a week ago. Um, and I'm changing job roles. So I'm testing my own personal resilience as we speak. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about, I am putting into practice at the moment. So I'm going to um, hopefully share you a PowerPoint. And this is where it gets interesting. Um, Zooming over PowerPoint is always interesting because there's no audience reaction, but please bear with me. So, yes, that's me. That's a better picture of me than the one you can see in the living room. Um, Steve Harris, I'm an operations commander in a metropolitan fire service. As Jeremy said, 29, 28 plus years in the fire service. I'm a middle manager. Personal life, I'm a father, a husband, a son, a brother, a friend. And yes, I've suffered from mental health problems. Specifically, stress, anxiety, depression. I was off work for some time. And I, I think that some of that lived experience helps me with what I talk about now. And I've been doing it for a hell of a long time. But I'm not anything special. And this slide is to show you that the picture you see there of me in fire kit, I don't run into burning buildings anymore. I'm, I've done it. I've lived that life. I now tell other people to do the dangerous stuff, which I kind of like that arrangement. Um, but I've got experiences, events, I've got dates and times that have shaped my life, shaped my own state of mind. And I've also suffered, as I said, from mental health issues. So I'm not going to profess I know everything that I'm talking about, but I have some experience of things that I'm talking about. So I hope you'll sort of go with it, go with the flow for a bit and, and, and let's see how it works. So resilience, I did, I did a bit of searching around resilience because it's an interesting word. If you do an Amazon search for resilience in leadership books, you get about 20 pages of books that you can read about resilience of all different types. That's without all the PDFs and the 
research papers you could read. <clears throat> if you Google search resilience in leadership, you get 120 million results. Well, we know what Google's like. Probably 119 and a half million of those are quite possibly useless, but it gives you an idea that resilience in leadership is something that everybody's talking about, writing about, selling stuff about. They use words like you need to reframe, basic things like get some sleep, cultivate all kinds of things. And then it talks about types of resilience as in psychological, emotional, physical, and community resilience. So there are all aspects of resilience that we talk about. The definition of resilience, and it's something that is interesting because there's a couple of definitions, it's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, from toughness, the often remarkable resilience of so many British institutions was one phrase, or it's the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape, elasticity. And then the other one, characterized or marked by resilience, it's capable of withstanding shock without permanent deformation or rupture. Now, for me, that's an interesting one because permanent deformation or rupture is talking about a thing, an item, an article, but we see permanent deformation or rupture in people who are trying to be resilient. Doesn't mean you're not resilient because I would say that I, I've ruptured and I have a permanent deformation in my character from the experiences I've had, but they all shape me into the person I am today. So it's interesting when you look at the, I suppose, the definition of resilience as to what we are going to talk about in the, in the next hour. But before we go on to that, I just want to set my stall out here. That's a rocket scientist, and that's what I'm not. I am not here today to dig deeply into the, the theory and the research and everything behind resilience. I have no formal qualifications in being a counsellor or anything like that. You can't get a qualification in resilience. I just consider myself, I'm very well read. I've taken a lot of this reading and my experiences and turned them into approach to resilience that I believe works. But I believe it works for me and it might work for you. And that's what I'm here to just talk about. Hopefully from today, you might take something from the whole hour. I'll be amazed and really pleased if you take the whole hour and you, you change your, your approach to, to resilience and leadership. But if you just take 30 seconds, one sentence, two words, then I'll be absolutely enthralled with that. You know, it, that's all I'm here about. You might think parts of it, I'm a bit mad. You might wonder what I'm talking about. But if you just stick with it, hopefully by the end of the hour, you'll get something to go, oh, I remember that and that will work in my setting. Not everything will work, but some things might. After this, I can de direct you to a lot of reading if you wish. I'll write a blog, which I'll talk about later. Um, and I just talk about mental health and resilience. That's what I try and do uh, in my daily life, on my blog and all that kind of things. So before all that, I'm going to show you where it all started. Any of you live in Birmingham, you can still go and see that if you, if you wish. It's not a well-known um, tourist hotspot. That's on Bath Row, near what was the old uh, accident hospital. And that little piece of damage you can see to that coping stone is all that's left of when we crashed a fire engine into a wall. Uh, 1994, a fire engine that I was a passenger on. And that's where I suppose my understanding, my interest and my devotion to resilience and trauma and debriefing started because we were en route to um, an old hotel somewhere down by her street, I can't remember the name, no, a long time ago. We were en route to a fire call. We didn't know if it was a false alarm. We didn't know if it was a real incident, an emergency or what. So we were driving there and there was an accident. And I can, I can probably tell you every single second and every single moment of that accident from 1994, because it's ingrained in my memory. And it's a trauma that I have learned to live with, but initially I didn't. And it took a few years and lots of, talking and journeys and emotional trips to to get through to that resilient part of me because the result of that coping stone that's what it looks like that because that's what hit it and that's an old fire engine we fortunately don't have fire engines like that anymore but i was a passenger on that fire engine i was sat behind the driver so the fire engine had four people on it that day normally would have five on and we were really lucky because part of that canal bridge came through the center of that cab and took out the back seat between me and my partner who was sat in the back. So had we had a fifth person, they probably wouldn't be around today. And I was lucky. I had slight injury, a bit of a shoulder injury, a bit of a cut shin. I managed to get out of there, go and call for the fire service to come down and help us out. 
the driver was lucky. The backseat, other backseat passenger was lucky as well. We got away with minor injuries. The guy there, you can see in the blue shirt, he was not so lucky. He took him, took about two and a half hours to cut him out of the, the fire engine and he didn't come back to work and, and he, he had to be medically retired from the fire service. So you can see en route, I was only, I'd only been in the fire service two years at that time, uh, en route to an incident that ended up like that. And what it led to, it led to me suffering an acute stress reaction for a considerable amount of time. And I sort of ignored it. I was a terrible passenger in a car for a long, long time. I'm still not the best now. I'm still dealing with it. Um, but I've learned, I've learned to deal with it now. But for a hell of a long time, I was a terrible passenger in a car. And it was a stress reaction to this. I was much better driving. I even then learned to drive a fire engine because I wanted to be in charge of the red thing because I knew it wouldn't crash if I was in charge of it. Um, my personal life suffered. I didn't know that at the time that that was the reason my personal life was suffering. My work life started to suffer and I considered making life changing decisions. I considered leaving the fire service because the, the reactions from the incident was leading me to be a terrible passenger. I couldn't relax on the back of the fire engine. I was getting anxious every time the, the bells went down, every time we went on route to a fire and I had to do something about it. And eventually I got some help and I had some, something called CBT which you'll all know about, hopefully, cognitive behavioural therapy. It was the early days of CBT then, but it, it worked. It helped. And the CBT specialist helped me recognise what the stress reactions were and how they were causing me to be anxious. Something as simple as I was gripping the hand grip on your car as a passenger, this side, as a passenger, I was gripping the hand grip of the car. I was tensing up my body. I was causing my body to be stressed and anxious and the fight or flight syndrome. And, and the uh, Alan, the guy said to me, is, is as hard as it is, Steve, you've got to stop gripping onto the hand grip. And slowly we worked through the anxieties of being a bad passenger. And I'm, I'm really oversimplifying that, but that's what happened. And I slowly worked through it. But that also then led me on to lead, learning a lot about my mind, about the mind of firefighters and, and how we operate and how we are affected by what we see, what we do, what we smell, what we taste. Uh, I became what's called a critical incident debriefer then. So we, as a fire service, had a um, critical incident debriefing team, which is where you would go and talk to people and debrief them after traumatic incidents. And that's what I've done for over 20 plus years uh, and really developed my own style of trauma debriefing based on numerous influences that I'll come on to. But it was just to tell you that's where it started for me. Uh, up until 1994, I think October 1994, I was just a run of the mill firefighter. My life changed then. It changed for the better ultimately, but I didn't know it at the time. So we come into the fire service, firefighting and emergency services. It's a tough job, but it's a rewarding job. I always say to people, it's the best job in the world. If they ask me a bit deeper and go, well, what about the stuff that you see? Well, yeah, we see dead people. We see traumatic things. We see people at the lowest point of their life that they're ever going to be. And that's the effect it has on some of us <clears throat> because we wear a mask. Yes, we wear a breathing apparatus mask to, to save ourselves going into burning buildings to, so that we can breathe clean air. But we never stop wearing that mask. And some of us, and, and a lot of firefighters, police, ambulance, draw, uh, literally, <clears throat> you can't forget the things you've seen, but you learn to live with them. And one of the points of the, the debriefing and the resilience talks that I do is I don't ever promise somebody they will forget what they've seen, but they'll find a way to learn from them, use them as lessons, use them as experiences. Some might forget, but I never make that promise because I always talk about the images, thoughts, tastes, smells, cries, all these things are files that we place in our head, in a filing cabinet in our head is what we talk about, or that you've got a bucket of water in, in, in your brain and every traumatic incident you go to is like a drip of water filling that bucket. And if you don't take the time to empty the buckies at some point, it will overflow. If you don't take time to empty the filing cabinet, eventually you won't shut the drawer of the filing cabinet. So we talk about that you only have a certain capacity for all this trauma and apply that to the business world. You only have a capacity for all the difficult conversations you have, all the talks about finance about stocks and shares about sales about achieving targets you only have a capacity for a certain amount and they're all stress reactions so firefighter goes to a traumatic incident 
and it, they can't sleep that night or they're a bit nervous about it or they just drive home a little bit slower that next morning because they've been to an RTC. Those are just stress reactions and they're healthy, healthy stress reactions. We, we, we can't fight them. You just got to learn to accept them and, and sort of build upon them and benefit from them. And you as a manager, as a director, as a team manager, you will have the same stress reactions as a firefighter just over slightly different things. So the stocks and shares might crash. You may have to make 50% of your workforce redundant. You may have had somebody fly off the handle in the office. They're all stress reactions that you have. When you go home and you can't sleep at night, some of it will just be normal stress. Some of it will be stress reactions. The trade unions are on strike and they've, they've planned a walkout. There'll be a stress reaction. On top of that, you've also got your own personal issues which no matter how hard you try, you cannot separate those from work. So if you've had a stressful night last night and you've logged on to this meeting this morning or you were, you were late logging on, you will be in a different place from if you'd managed to log on at half past nine and you sat with a cup of coffee and all relaxed. Now we know that and we recognise that in the fire service, that a firefighter who doesn't react to an incident today because they've had a real good night and yes, they've seen a dead body, could react entirely different tomorrow because they go home and their, their children have had a bad day at school and they've started the day stressed. We recognise that stress reactions can be different. And that's, it's about recognising that in your working world, in a corporate world, that the person that's comes in and has been the, the most productive worker in your company for the last 10 years could come in tomorrow and just not be very good. And that might just be one day or it might be one week or one month because they may have stuff going on in their life that they don't want to tell you about. And it's understanding that and finding a way to understand that. And I'm not saying it's easy. Um, but when we talk about firefighters, what we see mainly is post-traumatic stress reactions, not post-traumatic stress disorder. Emergency services do stuff, suffer from PTSD, but a lot of what we see is PTSR, post-traumatic stress reactions. Now, I'm not an expert on any of that, and anyone suffering from PTSD needs to go and get professional help. But there is stuff we can do before and stuff we can talk about, things we can do, things we can say that will help people either recognise that they're not coping or help them cope. And what we deliver and we developed over time is called something called diffusing and debriefing. So diffusing is usually at the scene of an incident. So these two firefighters you can see here, if that were in, in my organisation, we would go to the scene or we would see them before the end of their shift and we just make sure they're all right. Some basic Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, do you need a cup of tea, guys? If any of them smoke, do you want to go and have five minutes and have a cigarette? So we turn up and we just ask them how they are. How are you doing? What do you need from us? And we start signposting. We start saying, look, you might not sleep very well tonight. You might go home and, and, and have five coffees rather than the one because you, you're in a, a difficult place. And we just say that that's okay. We expect there to be a reaction from any sort of incident. However, one of these firefighters might go, Steve, I'm absolutely fine. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go to the pub. I'll be fine. That's what I do. Everybody reacts differently. And the first job of diffuse is to go, that's all right. If you react differently to, to your colleague, fine. Don't make life changing decisions, except you might not sleep very well tonight. Go home. You'll be okay. And then the debriefing is something that we do around four days later. And it's always on request. If somebody wants to, what we call a critical incident debrief, we'll talk to them four days later in that sort of homogenous group. Everybody that's been at the incident will come and we'll talk to them. Why do we do like that? Because we know that firefighter A, if they say, well, I didn't sleep very well and I'm really thinking about it. If firefighter B is scared to say it, just that shared experience will make somebody recognize that their reaction is normal. And that's something that you can apply to the corporate world. What we have in strength of in the emergency services is that homogenous group where people live and eat and sleep together. There's more of a, I don't want to say brotherhood, that's the, that's the wrong word, but they all understand they've all been to the same incident. They've all seen the same things. So there is, it's easier in my mind for, to have that shared experience, that shared understanding of what people are suffering from. Harder if you say you're working on the track at Land, Jaguar Land Rover and there's 3,000 people, a lot harder. How do we work at trying to bring this type of approach into the corporate world? How do we make you as your team leaders and your supervisors become that homogenous group? And that's part of the challenge. So part of my other journey, I, 
I went down to 28 days after Grenfell. We went and gave some help to London Fire Brigade. These are London firefighters you can see there. Um, I'm not saying that's from Grenfell, that picture. That's just, you can Google that picture. Um, but we went down to London uh, from our fire service, group of four of us, and we just helped facilitate some of the firefighters who were getting psychological help at that time. And essentially we sat in a few rooms and we just chatted to people, made them a cup of tea. And we were trusted because we told them we were from a fire service. So we were immediately accepted into that room. Um, interestingly, what we saw at Grenfell, what I saw at Grenfell in these firefighters was a large amount of bonding, as in people coming in and just hugging and crying and sharing emotions amongst each other, which is something I'd not seen in 20 odd years of, of doing this. So Grenfell was a, a massive change, as we know, in the whole firefighting world in the UK. But it was a massive change for those firefighters. And I sourced and heard stuff down there that are, they're not, I always said to people, they're not my stories to tell, particularly as part of the Grenfell inquiries going on. You know, I, I wouldn't share stuff. But the bond that was created because they, through that shared experience of those 70 odd dead people, you know, victims, was something that it really made me think and think differently about how we, how we go forward and try and carry on in this debriefing world and how we can apply it um, to, you know, I won't say a real life world, but to a corporate world. So I'm going, having said I'm not qualified, anymore, I'm just going to try and just talk a tiny little bit about how, how the brain works in a very, very simple way, because I am not a psychologist in any way. But when we talk about the flow of sensory information, because when a firefighter goes to incident, so I'm on that fire engine, I'm driving, I'm, I'm a passenger going to this incident. My fight or flight has, has been activated. And in a normal calm situations, the, the sensory information, it just goes to the amygdala and it, it's sorted out in the amygdala. It then goes to the hippocampus and you, it creates memories and then it finally goes into the prefrontal cortex. So there's a route. It goes from thalamus to amygdala to hippocampus to prefrontal cortex. So what you're listening to me today will follow that route. It's a nice, calm environment we're talking about. Your brain's got time to process it. During a traumatic exposure, and that could be anything, that could be you crash your car en route, you trip up getting off the bus, you know, you, somebody smashes your window. It could be anything, traumatic incident. The information is magnified. So the sight, sound, smells, touch and taste are magnified by the thalamus. And that's a genetic DNA thing. That's your fight or flight. That's so you, you ran away from tigers when you were hunter gatherer. Um, and it becomes magnified. And sometimes it gets a shortcut. Um, it doesn't go to the hippocampus. It goes straight through to the prefrontal cortex. So basically the, the flow just gets interrupted and they get trapped. As it says there, trauma memories get trapped in the amygdala. Uh, or they might go straight to the prefrontal cortex. So it just gets mixed up is the simple way of putting it. And that's when you can end up having flashbacks. You can have hyper arousal. So if any of you have been unfortunate enough to have been in an RTC, crashed your car, you'll be hyper aroused afterwards. It might only be a small sort of rear end shunt, but you'll be hyper aroused after you sorted out the insurance with the other driver. You'll be in your car. You'll be hyper aroused. Your levels will be up here you know, up, up sort of in, in your head, you'll be thinking, oh, I'm a bit nervous, put my seatbelt on, what am I doing, doing this and doing that. That's what we see in firefighters sometimes. And that's the, that's the bit that we try and just talk to people about and, and help them understand that that's a perfectly normal reaction. Fight, flight or freeze reaction is perfectly normal. And the thoughts and the emotions that come from that are perfectly normal. So it's about how do we help people just accept and try and work through that because flashbacks are normal. Flashbacks that last six, seven months that keep you awake and make you think you're back in that environment. Those are the ones that need the help. The firefighter that's talking to me after three days saying, Steve, I'm still not sleeping very well. I can still see that body. I can still see how we cut the, the body out of the car. I'll be like, yeah, that's okay. That's normal. Just give it time. And it's your reactions to that that are, that are keeping you awake. So we don't try to analyze or medicalize it we just allow people to talk about it so if you've had a car crash three weeks ago and you're still a bit nervous driving that's normal if you've had a car crash three years ago and you're still terrible and it still keeps you awake at night that's the kind of thing people need to go and get some professional help for and that's all we do in our world is 
try and be that intervention before people need medical help to go, you might be all right. Just give it a few days, you'll be fine. Or actually, you need to go and get some help. And that was where I got to. That's where I got to in 1994. It's where I got to a few years ago when I was off sick again. I just needed to go and get some professional help. And it's recognizing that. Um, because otherwise, these memories and these experiences just get stuck in a loop. So you have normal and abnormal responses to stress. So you've got um, all these normal responses. You all have these, I would imagine. Feeling strong emotions, subsequent to the event, fear, sadness, rage. A really high level meeting that hasn't gone too well. There'll be a bit of rage. Resistance to thinking about the event, some use of denial. Unwanted intrusive thoughts about the event. Temporary physical symptoms, headaches, stomach distress. Was I a bit nervous this morning for doing this? A little bit, yeah. I didn't have a headache, but I had butterflies in my stomach. It's a normal response. It's healthy. It's, it's just how it is. And the important bit there is resuming one's normal pattern of life. After this, I'll go back. I'll have a coffee. I'll sit down. I'll have a couple of biscuits in my lunch. I'll be fine. It's a normal response. It's a healthy response. And you suddenly, you know, within an hour or so, you're back to normal abnormal responses about being overwhelmed by intense emotions, panic or exhaustion, extreme resistance to thinking. These are firefighters. These are reactions that we sometimes see in firefighters. And you, if you think about it, we well, might have seen these in your team members, in your business world, continuing headaches, chronic stomach pains. The interesting thing about the abnormal responses is that they can become long-term problems in your ability to love and work. When we saw executive stress, executive burnout, it will be some of these abnormal responses. Sometimes it's just workload, absolutely. But abnormal responses are the ones that we just need to try and talk to people about and help them understand it. So that some go and get the professional help they need. Some go, okay, I get it now. I'll give it a few more days. I'll do these few things. I might be fine. But they're all normal reactions. Although it says abnormal, some of these are normal. It's about how you deal with the what they call abnormal responses is, is, is the important thing. And that's what this is all about, just trying to talk to people. So when we look at um, the reasons, start to look at the resilience of ourselves, our staff, our teams, our personnel, there's someone called Max Neef. He classified fundamental human needs into nine categories. <clears throat> and you can see them there, subsistence, creation, protection, freedom, and so on. You all have these needs. You all have the need for this. Um, and th these needs are either a, a quality, so it's a being, it's, a, it's always something that you need to have, or it's an action, or it's, an in it's a, something that you need in a setting. So you might need a, protect a setting that, that gives you protection. You might have the need for freedom. The important ones that I think that we need to look at in this, in this new world that we're in are protection, affection, and understanding. And in the fire service world, protection and affection, I think we get, and that's why we are better coped to deal with it, because we get the protection as in we're in a well-organized metropolitan fire service. I've got all the PPA I want. I have the protection of all the procedures. I have the protection of my team around me. You don't fight fires on your own. You fight fires as a team. So that comes with that protection. And then when I get back to station after a traumatic incident, I have the protection of a team. Be that we sit down excuse me and we have a cup of tea around the table that's that protection that's that understanding of people going yeah we get it we were all there and we've all worked hard for five hours we're just gonna have a cup of tea and we're just gonna just gonna chill and the affection comes from that then everybody understands what you've been through you know firefighters looking like that is more regular now than it used to be and people understanding that firefighters can be like that and and it's okay not to be okay means we now have that protection and we have that affection and the understanding. I would question or I'd ask you to think about, can you create that in your world? Can you create that just for yourself? You know, if you're a freelancer, have you got protection, affection, understanding in your world? Um, again, it comes back to Abraham Maslow's motivational theory. If you don't know it, you know, have a read up on it, as in the basic needs. Have people got food and water? In my world, that is, if I go out, to see firefighters for a debrief on a station, I'm going to get them a cup of tea. So we sit down and they go, yeah, we've got a cup of tea, we're nice and warm. They're ready to talk. And then they're ready for you just to go, is everybody okay? Because just that simple, is everybody okay, can make a difference. Because that picture there could easily be that picture there. 
for me, there is no difference. It, the all that's different is what causes that. The firefighters, it might be they've been out and seen a traumatic incident. For everybody else, for some of you, if, if, if that's been your office life, then it might be caused by share prices. It might be caused by the team haven't worked up, turned up today, or the delivery driver's not there, so I can't get my deliveries out to keep my customers happy. And the other thing that we talk about, when, and I've done a lot of reading on, is there's something called the Dunbar number. I'd ask you to think about this. Those of you that are on LinkedIn and have got 3,000 followers on LinkedIn and two, 250 Facebook friends. Robin Dunbar was an anthropologist and he looked at how primates groom themselves. And the Dunbar number, he said, there's a point beyond which we can't maintain meaningful relationships. And think about applying this to your corporate world, that there are only so many meaningful relationships you can have in work and at home. You know, Jeremy just said, you know, Jeremy and Claire, that's that meaningful relationship, business partners, life partners. That doesn't extend beyond about five or six people in that really close meaningful relationships. And the further you get out from your center, up to about 150, they're still relationships, but they're not meaningful. So where do you get your protection and your affection in your business world if you can only maintain a certain amount of meaningful relationships? In the fire service, we have that shared camaraderie. You know, I see a, if I see a firefighter on the, on the beach in Cornwall, he's a firefighter or she's a firefighter. We've got that shared understanding that we're both in the emergency services. If you see someone else walking along the beach who just happens to be in the corporate world, same as you, have you got that same shared understanding? So it's, for me, it's more difficult in the corporate world to understand how you get that protection and that affection and that understanding. So I'm not going to, it's interesting to say it, but you know, who, who would be the person that you would most be that, that ape that you're grooming the most? It's a, it's a funny way of putting it, but who's the person, who are the people that if you ring them at three o'clock in the morning are going to come around and, and help you out? Because if you haven't got that and you can't create that sort of understanding in your teams, it's, it's a route to poor resilience. It's, it's, it's the start of building resilience. If you can create some of these nine things, that understanding, protection, freedom, affection. So trying to come on the resilient lead. I'm keeping on the time. We're all right for time at the moment. So I want to just talk a little bit about my view of resilience, how I build my own resilience in an emergency service setting based on my experience, my personal tragedies. It's led me to a way of thinking. I just want to say I'm not perfectly. So I sometimes talk about this and we'll come on to it. About, it's a bit like being an alcoholic and apologies if anybody has been in that world. Is This is a daily thing that I work on. I see myself as a flawed professional. So I'm not perfect every day. None of us are but I try really hard every single day at being that resilience leader. And I have more good days than bad. And, and that's how I do it. Now mine, and this is where you might think this is going a bit, a bit strange here, but bear with it. Mine is based around stoicism. And as you see some of the next few words and phrases, you'll understand that stoicism is in a lot of what we do. In fact, CBT is based on stoicism. So, these sort of things, we suffer more in imagination than reality. Man is affected not by things, but the views he takes of them. If any be unhappy, unhappy by reason of himself alone. And then the big one there next to Stoicism, it's not the events themselves that cause us distress, but the way in which we think about them, our interpretation of their significance, our attitudes and reactions that give us trouble. So when I read and I thought and I applied that to crashing the fire engine, it wasn't the crash of the fire engine that was causing me distress because I literally had a cut shin and a bad shoulder. It was my reactions to the crashing of the fire engine that was making me a bad passenger, that was making me consider life-changing decisions. It was <clears throat> my interpreting the significance of that crash. Um, it was quite easy in that one. that It was just an accident. It was a crash. But it's easy to interpret things in your life that go, everybody's out to get me. Why is it always me? How am I always the one that gets this wrong? And that's where it can start to chip away your resilience. And that's where the top one, we can suffer more in imagination than reality. We can really overemphasize and really sort of catastrophize on things um, because that's what we do. That's what our brain does. So you don't need to read up or be into stoicism. It's just to say that that's what, that's what I work on particularly someone called Epictetus, a Stoic philosopher. 
Um, <clears throat> Stoics talked about there being a natural order to things. The, the traditional interpretation of Stoicism that they just, just don't care about stuff is, is not what we're talking about. It's about understanding that it's my reactions to the events that cause me the harm and the grief, not the events themselves. And in the early 60s, there was Albert Ellis and um, Mr. Beck, I can't remember his first name, bear with me. They took that and they worked it into cognitive behavioral therapy. So they took some of that reading, some of that understanding and worked on cognitive behavioral therapy or rational emotive behavioral therapy. And they proposed that emotional and behavioral problems could be relieved through the process of cognitive restructuring different to Freudian and analysis this year. So if ever you've had CBT, this is what they were talking about. It was heavily linked to these. And this is a, this is a slide that I found that made a lot of sense when I talked about it, because this is what, if you think about it, this is what we do. And this is what I was doing with lots of things. And in your daily life, in your family life, in your business life, you might do some of this. So you may have black and white thinking overgeneralizing, jumping to conclusions, catastrophizing is, a, is one we see all the time in the fire service. So a firefighter could have gone into a burning building and, and saved a life, but they'll still be thinking, well, if I hadn't turned, if, I, if I'd have turned right instead of left going up that burning staircase, I might not have found that body. And the other way, if somebody's died in a fire, the fire might, firefighter might be thinking, well, if I only had gone left instead of right, I might have found that body earlier. And they'd still be alive. It's catastrophizing because we have to say to them nine times out of ten, didn't make any difference. The firefighters going out to serious road traffic collisions where nine times out of ten, the dead body in a in a car that you've gone to save, he's probably dead before you turn out the fire end, fire station. Doesn't stop firefighters catastrophizing and jumping to conclusions about what's happened. And these are all cognitive distortions. Ah, oh, I should have done that. I could have done this. So Everything, every time we have a reaction, Beck and Ellie's talked about they are cognitive distortions. They're normal, you know, black and white thinking, overgeneralizing. It, you can't control it sometimes, but recognizing and understanding it is the route to more resilience. So every time, if anyone goes for CBT, your CBT specialist will be, they won't be giving you a list of 15 things and ticking them off, but in their brain, they'll be working you through and trying to help you understand that this filtering, this black and white thinking, you know, why is it always me that gets picked out in the board meeting to do the, do the, the terrible jobs? Yeah, people will jump to conclusions over things like that. Um, so cognitive distortions, it's something to, once you think about it and understand it, you can suddenly start putting stuff in boxes and go, okay, I can see how, how I'm reacting to that event. And it's my reaction that's causing me distress, it's causing me harm. And these cognitive distortions is what CBT is based upon. They will be prevalent in your daily life and particularly your working life. But it's about understanding, recognizing that and thinking, right, how do I, how do I start to help myself work through some of these cognitive distortions? All based on stoicism. You know, Beck and Ellis read a lot of stoicism and they, they turned it into CBT. So... That's why, that's why my brain talks about stoicism and the ancients and, then, and we go to that world. But if you think about it in your corporate world, you will see either yourselves, your team members, the managing upwards, managing downwards, you will see some of these things. Well, you should have done that. And, and we wouldn't have had the um, delivery driver go wrong. Or you blame yourself for something that's gone wrong that's in, not your fault. But ultimately, you blame yourself because you are the leader, you are the manager. And that's fine. That's how the world is sometimes, but it's how you then react to that and how you work yourself through it. You know, overgeneralizing, jumping to conclusions. If you think deeply and honestly, you will have seen some of it. Personalization. It's always me. Why are they always picking on me? Why are they always blaming me? It might not be that. It's just that you are distorting those particular things. Control fallacies. Have a think about them. You know, if you, if you want to, sort of google cognitive distortions and do a bit of reading trust me you'll find that you are doing some of this in your daily life in your work life probably even in your family life and it's about how you work through those reactions and control your personal reactions to the situation so we firefighters it's about saying to them it's not your fault the drunk driver did this and crashed this car 
you were professional, you did this, you dealt with it. Unfortunately, that person's died. How do we help you deal with your reactions to that? And that's just through talking. It's just through asking the people if they're okay. What we know is from a traumatic incident, 95% of people, the research says, will recover after four days. As I always said, they won't forget the incident they've been to, but after four days, they'll generally recover, feel a lot better about themselves and slowly learn and, and work through it. So now you've got excuses. We're going to go from Stoicism to Buddha, to Buddhism. I'm not promoting Buddhism as any kind of faith or religion. If you're a Buddha, fine. If you're a Buddhist, absolutely fine. But to try and show that this, this sort of how we deal with things bleeds through a lot of life. Buddha used a lot of parables. And he used the parable of the arrow. And he, he, he was talking to one of his, his pupils and said, if a man were wounded in an arrow, thickly smeared with poison, his friends and his kinsmen would say, well, we'll just pull the arrow out. And the wounded person would go, no, I don't, I'm not having this arrow removed until I know who wounded me. Was it a warrior? Was it a priest? Yeah, I'm not going to have the arrow removed until I know the name of the person that wounded me, until I know his height and his weight, whether he's tall or short. Where did he live? So the parable goes on to say, eventually the man died because the man was trying to understand why did somebody shoot me? Why did they pick me? Where did they come from? Rather than pulling the arrow out and trying to recover. So the man suffered because he was too busy worrying about and overgeneralizing and catastrophizing and black and white thinking and filtering rather than going, I'm going to pull the arrow out and then I'm going to deal with it after that. So his reactions to the arrow was what caused him to die, not the arrow itself. I know it's a very weird way of looking at it. And it's the first time I've sort of tried this and were we all in the same room? I could see your faces. I'd know whether this was going down well or not, but you just got to go with it sometimes. Um, so what Buddha said is the reason the arrow was shot and who shot it is not important. The only thing in your control at that point is removing the arrow. And that's where we come to traumatic reactions. The only thing in your control, and Stoicism talks about this, is your reaction to the event. So COVID is a great thing, as in, to, as not a great thing, I suppose as an analogy. COVID lockdown was out of all of our control. The fact that you've all had to sit in your living room for the last 12 months is out of your control. How you decide to react and, and work and live in a COVID world was the only thing in your control. So me sitting here at my dining table, I absolutely hate it. But it's in my control to control my working day, to after this go out and have a coffee and sit by my fish pond or whatever. That's in my control. The lockdown is not. And as soon as you try and understand that, you can then try and work through your reactions to lots of different things. Um, so accepting that the arrow has been shot at you is that you do it. Focusing on what's in your control and the effects of the arrow is the interesting thing. And that's the challenge for people in, in any kinds of world. So how do you translate this to your world? You know, share prices crash. That's generally out of your control if you're in that multinational business. How you react to that is within your control. You've had a really horrible meeting in a boardroom or you've had a team meeting over, over teams and somebody's kicked off. Some of it's out of your control. What's in your control is how you react to the person that kicks off, how you deal with them, how you emotionally react to people is the bit that's in your control. I'm just gonna leave you to think about that one. So then we to come on to a wellbeing strategy. And for me, a well-being strategy starts with yourself and then starts with your workforce after that. So if you've, not, if you've done that self-inventory of yourself every day before you come into work, then you'll be in a stronger place to deal with some of the workplace stresses, some of the things that, that go on. Um, so for you and your workforce, and if we was to go on to talk about you know, some training around a resilient workforce, do you have an open approach to talking about work, like workplace stress? Do you have an employee assistance program? You know, there's lots of company out there that will specialize in employee assistance programs. Do your employees feel safe to talk about these things? Have you got a close cohort or community within your workspace? Yeah, that might be you've only got two or three people, but have you got that close cohort? Someone you can go, I'm having a bad day today. I'm not doing very well. Has your company got an early 
intervention strategy to prevent more Ocheal referrals. What we know is if you can do early intervention, you might prevent more Ocheal referrals, you might prevent some of that long-term sickness. You know, the statistics on mental health at work and stress place, workplace stress absence, it's high. What are you doing about tackling it early? What's your diffused and debriefing approach? Now, we know you don't regularly have traumatic incidents at work, but have you got a sort of informal diffusing approach for people to people who are having those traumatic stress reactions from a meeting or from something that's not happened well have you got a strategy for that but at the bottom of all that and it should be at the top really is on a personal level are your needs met what's in your control when you come in every day what's in your control today and what's not in your control and you've got to try and let go of and it's a real leap of faith to go yeah that's not in my control like i said right at the start up until two or three weeks ago i was managing a team of 50 odd people today i'm not and it's took me two or three weeks of really understanding what's in my control as i said work on it every day to recognize that that's not in my control actually what's in my control is how i feel about it how angry i get about it and what i do to move forward so as i said i, I try and live this every day and it's a real challenge some days i'm not sitting here saying this is the answer to all your resilience but it is a start if you approach it from, okay, I can't control that bit, but I can control how I react to it. You know, it, read the book, The Chimp Paradox, and it talks about things like that. Your workers have come in and they've had a bad day and they're, they're really angry at you and they're shouting at you as the boss. Sometimes you go, well, I can't control that they're angry at me, but I can control how I react to them, how I deal with them. And it might be that that person doesn't need me to give them a a dressing down they just need me to understand and ask them if they're all right so that's what we it's what i try and do on a daily basis as that sort of leader and that resilient leader you think where's, where's this coming from where's this reaction coming from from this person and it's important how i react to that person one for my own resilience and my own well-being but two for theirs and their ongoing our ongoing relationship so and then I, I've just wrote down five stoic principles that helped me. I won't say I live by these because it's really hard to live by everything every day. But I do try. So you can't change things outside of your control, but you can change your attitude. And that's what I talk about regularly. If you read a lot of my blogs, that's what I talk about. I can react one way, I can react the other. And it's making that decision on a daily basis leads to that resilience. Makes me a re resilient person, a resilient leader myself. Find someone you respect and use them to stay honest. That comes back to Dunbar. You know, who, who are your close people that you can ring up and go, excuse my language, am I being an arse here? Yeah, you need somebody to be honest with you. It will go, yes, you are. Now think differently about it. If you are that chief executive of an organisation, how do you do that? You know, you might not have someone that can do that, but can you find someone? Be genuine, cheerful in all your actions. Yeah, that's an hard one. It's an hard one for all of us, but it helps because I can be cheerful in most of the stuff that I do. Recognise there's life after failure, quite pertinent for me at the moment. I wouldn't say moving teams is a failure, but recognising that I can do something else, it's not a problem. Practice your values beats preaching them. Again, these are just things I'm just throwing at you as thoughts and ideas. If you take one of those five, fine. You don't need to live all five of those. That's not what uh it's not what i'm talking about just a little buddhist quote you know buddha said do not oh it's the dalai lama actually do not try to use what you learn from buddhism to be a buddhist use it to be a better whatever you already are so whatever you've learned today if you've learned anything don't just use it to be better at what you're already doing it doesn't have to be a life-changing scenario today I'm good for time, Jeremy. It might be five minutes early. So finally, it's what I've asked people to think about in the past. Are you pushing people from behind? Are you dragging them from the front? Or actually you're walking alongside them with your arm around them, guiding the way, making sure they don't fall. And that's what I talk to people about in the fire service world, particularly around trauma. Because sometimes they need you alongside them. It's going, there's a hole in the road there. Should we just walk around it? so that they don't fall in. You can apply that to the corporate world. When it could, the advantage I have, and I'm sitting here now, and the advantage I have is I don't have to produce 
stocks and shares and outcomes and I don't have to produce widgets every day and hit targets. We just have to save life. And I say we just, because that's that makes it sound like it's far more simple than, than your world. They're just different worlds that we inhabit. It's easier sometimes for me to do that than it might be in the corporate world. And this is the challenge for us now. How do we take some of this and apply it to a corporate world? I'd be really interested in your thoughts about that. You know, if we if we can develop this. But yeah, are you walking alongside people? Are you guiding the way back as you they don't fall? Or are you pushing them or dragging them? We'll finish on that. That's my WordPress blog. Please feel free to uh, have a look. If you want to contact me after this, then speak to Jeremy or Claire for Abbott's group. Um, and that's me. 50 minutes, Jeremy. I hope that's all right. Yeah, that, that's brilliant, Steve. Massively, massively enlightening. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions here. I'll read them as they've come in. So the first one is, I'm not sure if it will be covered but does Stephen help people whose reactions differ if they worry the others are not feeling the same? Yes. We had this chat yesterday, didn't we, Jeremy, actually? We did indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if I was debriefing a room of... So we might debrief, say, five people on a fire engine. Um, and we, we try to normalise. So, yeah, we could have... Let's say five out of Fred could be... Yeah, I've seen two people killed in an RTC yesterday. I'm all right. I've seen it every day in my career, pretty much. I'm going to go home, I'm going to have a beer, I'll be fine. The other side of the room, I've seen firefighters who are emotionally distressed and traumatised by it. And that's the importance of the group sharing session is that it's just to help them understand that both reactions at polar opposites are entirely normal. And what we can't do is control how we react. I know personally for me, it's, it's, it's quite morbid talking about like this, going out and seeing a, a burnt body in a building I'm kind of used to that now. I know what it's going to look like and I, I'm, I'm all right with it. I just get used to it. It's not my problem. I react to the family's emotion. So I know which bits to avoid. But I also know that tomorrow I could go out to a burnt body and because I've had a stressful day, I might react to it differently. So it's just saying these polar opposites. Yeah, both reactions are normal. You, Your brain just works differently to yours. How do we help you both accept that that's the normality of things? So yeah, we do we do embrace it and we just say, yeah, it's normal, it's fine, don't worry. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Um, another one here. Uh, do they have trained counsellors that come in and offer support? Our company doesn't, so it wouldn't sorry, our company doesn't, so wouldn't know where to look for external support if it's needed. Let me let me say that again, because I <laughs> that was rubbish, uh, rubbish reading for me. Um so do they have trade do you have trained counselors that come in and offer support our company doesn't so wouldn't know where to look for external support if needed yeah so we, we're looking at our fire service we have a strong occupational health department so what i talked to you about debriefing defus diffusing is one small element of the whole care package that we have so yeah i could if i was emotionally traumatized and needed help i could through our occupational health referral go and see a trained counselor the bit that i'm talking about that we do is if we are not trained as counselors we go out to a station and we it's it, it's almost a trauma peer support but yes we do have trained counselors we use uh, a company called working minds uk i think for some of our stuff and we have counselors that we have access to we have a 24-hour employee assistance phone line so there's two elements there. Yes, we do, but we we don't. I wouldn't be able to tell you that we don't call trained counsellors in. You have to go through the occupational health route. Okay. Um, so another one comes in. Uh, yeah, somebody's asked if you were to come into a business, what would be the kind of processes? So how, in other words, if you came in as a resilience mm -hmm. mentor or a resilience <laughs> trainer from sort of cradle to grave, what would you actually do? Obviously, it's very dependent on what the client's looking for. However, that, that, what, what this person's asking is, is there a kind of, this is what I do, and I'll build what I do around specifically what you want? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, I wrote myself, um, I wrote my own model called the Harris model, ironically. I tried to be cute and copyrighted about 
a sort of a, a, you know a windscreen model to it for me is there's some pre-education it's in the fire service we pre-educate new firefighters go look you're going to see some stuff that's going to affect you so you pre-educate people you prep them for it the middle bit of this windscreen model then is is that early intervention that crisis intervention you know critical incident debriefing whatever you want to call it to the far end of the scale which is actually all the talk is not going to help you you need to go and get some professional help so i would propose that i would come into a business and look at those two early stages how can we stop some of that lower level stuff to stop it leading on to more severe emotional trauma and absence you know because the the aim in all this is to keep people well but the aim is to keep them at work so it's that early intervention and come almost i suppose you know thinking off time here coming almost as a consultant saying well what have you got where are your little homogenous groups that, that care for each other how can you build that ethos within your organization be it small or large that people look after each other and stop that early level stress okay another question has come in about resilience and conflict kind of the two go hand in glove so if, if you and I are working in a team, not, not in, in the fire services, but in business, and um, I'm struggling to deal with something in a different way to you, that could naturally put pressure on our relationship. Certainly, you know, if you're my manager and I'm your, 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 your staff member or vice versa, um, if, if we don't handle a, a traumatic situation or it could be something not traumatic, but it could be a devastating blow to our department. For example, we've spent the last six months working to, to get a tender over the line with the council, and we've pinned so much on getting that tender, and then we find out we've lost it, and we all feel completely dead in the water, and thinking, well, what's the point? You know, we get our salary every month, but, you know, we haven't kind of built a plan B or a plan C. We, we kind of, we just assumed we were going to get this. We they made all the right noises we we've, we've put six months worth of resource into this and and now you know there's this massive void that we need to fill and it is your fault no 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 it's your fault you should have done that differently i should have done that differently so uh when it comes to resilience there's also a lot of and i agree with this there's a lot of finger pointing and blaming others because i could become defensive and think, well, I need to scapegoat you, Steve, or Steve is going to scapegoat Claire, and Claire's going to say, well, you know, it wasn't my fault because you haven't done. So you can actually get a, t a team turning in on each other. And, you know, you see it in sport. You know, you can see, yep. you know, if, if you've got a football side that, that are 3 0 down at half time, you can see that, the, that, that there's already an imbalance if you like there's 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 yeah. conflict within the team because somebody is blaming the other one you know you should have done this you should have done that so how do you deal with conflict contrary conflict in the context of resilience and dealing with a huge not trauma but a huge di disappointment that could render that business um you know losing millions of pounds yeah interesting interesting difficult question thanks for that um <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think that for me, that's the challenge. That is the, I I'm not sure of all the reading I've done, whether that sort of resilience in, in, the, in the business world is, is looked at. It is pretty much, and what we benefit from in the fire service is people stay and rarely leave the fire service. So you build that group and you build that trust. Whereas sometimes in the corporate world, it's, your sales aren't going very well this month. Guess what? I, I spoke to someone. If anyone works with Dell, I apologize, but I spoke to a guy from Dell years ago, Dell Computers, and he said it was a brutal world. It was you'd go in on a Monday morning, and if your sales hadn't gone so well the last month, they'd walk down the corridor and you'd, you'd be sacked. Sign this non disclosure, you're out. So sometimes I think it's massively difficult to, in a corporate world, because of the environment, is it's easier to just get rid of you than deal with the, the issues. For me, it's about I'll always go back to how do we build that, that company team ethos, that homogenous group of people that, that are working for the company, not just for the wage. And I know, I know how difficult that is. You know, we got firefighters that go, I just want my wage. I, I don't really care. There'll always be those people. It's about how do we start to build that ethos that mm. actually we're all in this together. And Jeremy, you, you've had a bad day. And yeah, I've got to have a serious word with you about your lack of sales, but there's a how I do that 
mm. that, that can be better than Jeremy, get it right next week or you're sacked. Yeah. And I'm not saying that goes on in every company, but I know that it does in some. Mm. Uh, so it's about what I learned, what we learned in the fire service and trying to apply that to corporate world, knowing how difficult that will be because I don't have to make a profit. <laughs> I'll just have to put fires out. Um, sure, sure. But you, you know, you're still responsible for your team. And if there's any yeah. fatalities in your own team, you, know, you, can't, you can't be held responsible for, for the, 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 what's in front of you. You can only deal with what's in front of you. Yeah. But obviously, if, if you're manning a team, then you know, you're responsible for how that team performs. Um, and egos can't get in the way, which yep. they often do. Yep. That's what humans do. So looking at things like, you know, the emotional intelligence side of, of, of resilience, you know, what I find quite fascinating about emotional intelligence is what you tend to find is, is that one emotion um, is whatever emotion you have, there, there, there is a, a conflicting emotion as well and what happens is one of those two emotions will trigger you and what will happen then is you will be left feeling um depressed anxious angry even a sense of imbalance you may feel euphoric amazing <laughs> fantastic and you've won the lottery it depends which one of the two um triggers you the problem is out of those two emotions one will dominate over the other yep. so the net result is the thing that triggers you it's the other emotion that dominates that and case in point is looking at when we let's say are fearful of something we could also feel a sense of relief mm -hmm. so resilience around emotional intelligence could you perhaps put a spin on on that to sort of where we're looking we're looking at the the emotional side and how we feel about a trauma or an upsetting situation yeah and and again you know applying it to to, to what i've seen yeah i have seen firefighters you know crying in front of me which in a way we we're thankful for because it means they're happy to say what they're feeling but yeah. The emotion, again, it's what we talk about. The emotion is the reaction to the trauma. You know, firefighters have been out and, and seen people dead in a road traffic collision. You know, and let's say it's a traumatic incident. The emotion when they come back is normally it's that, it's that come down from the adrenaline. I normally say to them, what's the first thought you have when you've come off autopilot? That will usually be the emotional one and the one that sticks with you. For me, it's I went to a car crash and we saw a, a, a kid had died on the M6. And there were birthday cards in the car. And someone opened up a birthday card and read it out to me. You're like, why have you just done that? So that sticks with you. And that's the emotional reaction to the incident. The kid, the kid had been dead. He'd been dead for an hour. We were there just sort of sheeting up and, and doing some dignity stuff. So dealing with the emotional reactions is the key to all of it for me. And the, the way we do that is the team that go out and will do a sort of debrief. It's that Yes, it's peer support. So I'm it starts with trust and confidentiality. They trust me enough to go, I'm happy to tell Steve and his team whatever is going on. And then you can dig into the emotion and go, yeah. I've had firefighters crying in a debrief and go, hey, it's all right. It's okay to cry because that's what you're feeling at this moment in time. What we try and do is deal with what's left after, after an incident because the crying for me is a good way of accepting the emotion and getting it out. So you may have people in the office environment who've just got to have a bit of a meltdown and a cry. That's all right. How do we, how do we then build you back up from that? It starts with emotional intelligence of, of the person of me to then understand that they don't need me to shout to them at this moment in time. They need something different. And that might be that cup of tea. Yeah, absolutely. I know we talked about this yesterday, but I think it's worth bringing it up again for the, for the purpose of this session um, is, is that you, it's good when people cry. It really is because if we're crying then we're releasing those emotions and we can let things go easier it's the people who go no i'm unaffected yeah. and it, it comes back to bite you maybe not today or tomorrow it might be five years time and, and again moving away from the fire service um I, let's talk about business um so say for example i've been at a company as a sales manager for 10 years and uh, the sales director leaves 
and I'm told I say to HR, I, you know, I, I, I want to go for the sales director's role. That job is mine. I've been at the company for 10 years um, or five years or however I've done all my targets. I, I get on with the team and I'm thinking it's just a formality. All I've got to do is, is apply and I'll get the job. And then um, Claire comes in as sales director over me and I'm thinking, hang on a sec, I'm really not happy. Um, you know, I, that job's mine. You know, I've, 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 I've been at the company for such a long time. I've never missed yep. a target, blah, blah, blah. And I go to the HR director or the CEO and say, how come I didn't get that job? And they say, Jez, you're a great salesman. You're a brilliant salesman, but you, you're not a leader. You're not a manager. You're not, you don't have those leadership qualities. So I know that I could give you a budget or I'd give you a target, sorry, and I could give you stuff to sell and you'll smash that target and you'll make loads of money. But that doesn't make you a good communicator. It doesn't make you a good leader. Um, so I'm 44 years old. I, I've learned to swallow my pride over the years, but maybe somebody slightly younger than me or a bit more arrogant than me. They're not going to take that well. Are, are, is a grown man going to burst into tears in front of the new sales director and the CEO? No, they're not. But what they're going to do is they've, they, 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 they've been, they've had their, there's a mental issue there. They, they, they feel that they have been let down. They feel downtrodden. They might feel worthless. They might have a sense of profound insecurity, um, which is going to come out in their performance. Um, and, and it's almost more worrying um, that somebody doesn't explode and have a massive paddy that, that can be dealt with there and then. And they're carrying that, um, yep. that, that grievance, if you like. Um, how am I going to perform for Claire? Am I going to accept her as my, as my boss? Um, so when we look at resilience, we're also looking at um, how we perform when we are personally disappointed. So we've talked a little bit about the team being disappointed and there being an element of blame if they didn't get that tender. But how do we as individuals deal with our own? How do we become more resilient as people to be able to deal with a, a major blow like that? It's going to it's going to send me two ways. It's either going to send me one way where I'm going to stay at the company and be really mm -hmm. awkward and difficult, or I'm just going to leave and go to another company out of spite. Um, so as, as my CEO, how would you motivate me to stay at the company and work harmoniously with Claire, supporting her in her role as sales director, knowing fully well that I'm really disappointed and I feel let down by you and the company? Wow, it's challenging me with these questions today, aren't you? I mean, sitting there listening to you, you know, I, the other area of, of my world that I, I'm working on developing is coaching. And for me, that person, is, is that's, that's where for me, some sort of coaching would come in but coaching based about what we've talked about almost a coaching around resilience because yeah they're always going to you're always going to get passed over for promotion at some point we all have in our life unless we're really lucky you know it's happened to me and it's about how do you how do we again keep you on board in the company how do we help you accept that there's just always that's always going to be out of the world is because again it comes back to your, your reactions to being passed over is the issue not the fact that someone that Claire got the job over you? It's how you react to that. And for me, that is that coaching around personal and emotional resilience and understanding. So it's about me, not as your immediate supervisor saying, Oh, bad luck, Jeremy. You know, better luck next time. It's about having someone detach that coaching relationship to go, Well, let's explore yeah. what happened here and how are you reacting to it? Because yeah, you know, there's, there's a, there's um, I think, I think it was Cicero, another ancient philosopher, talked about the, the Stoic Archer. You could have been the best prepared for that. So the, the Stoic Archer, the story is that Stoic Archer's got the best bow, the best arrow, the best training, the wind's favourable, and everything on that day. Once the archer lets go of the bow and the arrow, whether it's the target, is out of their control. Mm. And that's the same in any promotion process. I always say to people who I'm coaching for interviews, I can get you, I can coach you, I can get you through the door, but if someone's better than you on the day, you've just got to accept mm. that they're better than you on the day. But that sentence in itself, it's all right saying it. You know, I'm sitting here going, well, just don't be worried about it. That's, that's how life is. Getting people to understand it for me is, is that 
that coaching thing. It's that empathetic conversation to go, well, let's really explore what's going on here. Yeah. And that's the, that is, you know, got to be a multimillionaire if I could crack that. <laughs> that's the tough bit. But that's, that's why coaches get paid a lot of money because they come in and deal with that. That executive coaching, I think, that can be coaching in any company. That lower level coaching can work. That in the moment coaching, we talk about and we've done a lot of work on you know, sitting at your desk doing the coaching of, of the person I'm sat next to. Yeah. I'm not sure I have the answer, but it's that that needs working on for me. Sure. Excellent. Well, look, thank you, Steve. That takes us to 10 past 11. Um, let's have a five minute conflict break, re, re, uh, re, resume at uh, quarter past. 11 then we're going to have about 20 minutes or so of, of putting everything um that that Stephen has said uh, in theory into practice with 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 a live demo and then we'll finish off with some q a so i'll i'll see you at uh, 11 15. cheers guys Brilliant. thank you okay welcome back everyone um right so let's kick on with with the role practice uh, with with Claire and Steve. Um, so, Claire, if you can uh, turn your camera on for me, please. Claire, are you there? Can't see you. There you go. Right. Sorry. Fantastic. I was just replying to something in the Q and A box. Sorry. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Okay. So I'm going to uh, leave Steve and Claire to uh, crack on with this part of the session. Um, of course, keep the questions coming in. It's probably better you send them to uh, or send them via the Q&A rather than use the chat box, because the chat box goes to uh, both Steve and Claire, which is a bit distracting. So if you can put any messages in the Q&A, then I can deal with them as the host. So without further ado, Claire, Steve, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Claire. Okay. So do you want me to do the background on the kind of situation or? Yeah, um, I think we set these up. These are you sort of ringing me as just a, you know, a colleague who's got a bit of knowledge and try and help you out with something. Yeah, so the situation is that one of our team members, Joe, had a major breakdown at work, got up from his desk, let out an awful scream, threw his desk um, stuff everywhere, collapsed, hit his head on the desk. He needed an ambulance, was taken to hospital. Um, we've got an open plan office. Um, about three quarters of the team were here. Team were obviously upset, shocked, having seen what they've seen. Um, and I've got managers wanting to know how we're going to get our targets hit, who's going to pick up Joe's work and how how we're going to manage it, basically. Um, where okay. for me, I've got slightly upset by seeing what I've seen. I didn't haven't slept very well. Keep seeing, keep kind of reliving it when I'm sat in the office. I can just see where it all happened. So, and I've got a couple of, I've got some staff that are struggling with it. Don't really know how to bring up kind of carrying on as normal with the workload and that sort of thing. Okay. When did it happen, Claire? Yesterday. Right. Okay. So firstly, it's, I would be saying everything you're telling me is understandable. About yeah. The reactions and stuff. We'll deal with the workloads and stuff in a minute, but yeah, the fact that you didn't sleep well last night and you're sort of we're reliving it a bit you know that's normal mm -hmm. and I, I would just say i know it's easy for me to say that to you but that's a normal reaction because it's a traumatic thing i guess it's something in your you know your career at this company you've never witnessed something like that no, so, not so. yeah you are gonna you are gonna have those reactions clear and I, i'd be saying that don't worry about that too much because it's a normal reaction we're only sort of 24 hours away from that incident it's out it's beyond the normal range of expectations you didn't turn up to work yesterday expecting to see a colleague taken away in an ambulance so you're yeah. going to react to it so you know, first of all i can see you look quite calm you got a cup of tea and you you're talking to me that's that's a good start you know you're sort of asking for some help and some guidance it's normal and your staff struggling with it you know that's a that's a perfectly understandable and normal reaction if you saw that in the street, you'd be thinking about it 
to a stranger, you'd be thinking, oh, shame for that person. So the fact that it's happened to, to Joe, yeah, it's even more emotionally attached to you. So it's a normal reaction. And I'd say if you saw me in two days' time, I'd say, Steve, I'm still thinking about it. I'd be like, yeah, that's normal as well. Mm-hmm. Trying, not to, <clears throat> trying not to fight those reactions is the best way of dealing with it. And it will over time dissipate your, you're in this heightened mode at the moment. So just taking the time to go, just accepting that, actually, I'm going to think about this for a few days because yeah. it's a bit like if you cut your arm, you can still, you can still see the cut in your arm. It hurts for a few days and you go, yeah, I know it's going to be sore for a few days. Mm-hmm. If it's sore for six, seven months and starts to get infected, that's when we need to do something about it. So I'm not saying that not over trivializing what happened to Joe, but, your reaction and your team's reaction is really normal. Mm. A bit more difficult for you, though, is now you've got the pressures of, well, Claire, what's happening? Your bosses are going, well, someone's got to do Joe's work. How are we going to meet the targets? Yeah. That's something that, yeah, we can't, we can't get away from. Business, the wheels have still got to keep turning. But so have you thought about what, what we might be able to do with the staff? Is it the whole team that's struggling, just two or three of them? Um, I've got two people that haven't come in because they just have asked for a couple of days at home, which I've said, yeah, take the time you need. If you want to talk, you can come in and have a chat. Um, a couple of people are still quite kind of chat- wanting to talk about it, but not because they don't want to seem like they're gossiping, but they feel they want to talk. So they're kind of a little bit torn, really, with how how to behave, what to do. And a couple of guys have just kind of gone, well, he's in hospital. I'm sure, he's fine. I've got work to do. Um, which is a little bit worrying because I kind of think, well, should I be encouraging them to talk or should I just leave them to deal with it in their own way? Yeah, it, it's exactly, it's a mix of everything for me. It's, you've done the right thing. If two don't want to come in, you're only going to compound their trauma a little bit by making them come in. But I would suggest that we, we keep an eye on them. We keep regular contact with them. Um, yeah. And then you've got this mix of people who go, yeah, he's in the right place. You know, I can't do anything about it. I'm carrying on my work the others that are struggling it's about either we we look at getting a bit of a group discussion together just a, a check-in moment you know is everybody okay how are you doing or it's that sort of one-to-one it, I suppose it depends on on your team profile how well they know each other do you get the chance for everybody to down tools for an hour and have a chat um excuse me and it's just about as I'm trying to talk to you it's going you know it's all right you two are not reacting that's fine you two are struggling that's fine as well. It's about how do we as a team get everybody back to a point of accepting that this has happened to Joe, understanding that our reactions are normal. And it's, so it's almost, we, you know, if we can try and create a space for people to talk about and feel comfortable in, be that organised or just informal, where you manage to just go and have five minutes at the desk of everybody, comes back to whether you're in the right place for that, though, as a, as a person, Claire. You know, we want to make sure you're strong enough to do that first. Yeah, I suppose in a way I feel a little bit guilty because I know he's had a few problems at home and I'm kind of questioning, should I have stepped in sooner? Should I have kind of checked in with him sooner? Should somebody from HR maybe have a chat and said, is that all right, can we offer you any help? So I've got that to deal with. Um, and whether am I in the best place to bring everybody together and say, right, let's all sit and chat. Or whether actually some people might prefer to do it on a one-to-one basis. Okay, so... That guilt, guilt is a perfectly normal reaction. We see that all the time in in the world that I've dealt with. Fear, guilt, anger, sadness. It's it's a normal reaction. Yes, you are going to, in your head, I'm not saying you are guilty, but you're going to feel guilty because should I have recognised it? Should I have known more about Joe? All out of your control, really. But the guilt, the guilt is something you're going to feel. We would all feel that guilt. And it's how you react to that. And But again, it's back to, we get you emotionally strong, get you in the right place, get you the right support and support the team. And mm. some of that can be done just through a, are you all right? Sit down, don't we do, and have a cup of tea and just ask. I was talking, the, I, I call it, you know, the, the, the coffee cooler conversation, the water cooler conversation, I should say, not yeah. the coffee cooler. It's, there'll be opportunities in the day where you could recognise that, let's call her Jane. Jane in the team is really quiet. Jane might not want to talk in an open environment. There'll be opportunities, natural opportunities in the day where you can go, you're right, Jane, you want a coffee? So we don't have to single people out. If you if you know your team well enough, you'll know the ones that will be up for the, yeah, I'm, I'm angry about why we've got to do all this and Joe's not really well. And there'll be the ones that will go, I'm just going to have a coffee with Jane. So for me, it's about 
getting you in a strong enough resilient place to then sort of pick out the people that need the one-to-one conversations <clears throat> the managing upwards with your bosses about targets you know that's how we've got to we, we know from experience if we can get the team back together and gelling together what we can't resolve is joe's in hospital we can't yeah. do anything about that but we can deal with how we react to that and people won't forget i can't imagine it's normal to see somebody collapse at the desk in your environment so we can't we can't trivialize that and we can't tell you that they're ever going to forget it but we can help them deal with it you know mm. make the workplace a better place to be in try and make them feel comfortable coming into work but it's about how do you sitting and understanding your team i think and going actually will it will a will a one-to-one work better than a five people in a room having a conversation yeah. and, a, and allowing people to talk about it which yeah. is really challenging but it's healthy if people are allowed to go actually claire i don't feel very well about this and so can i just have a chat go, yeah of course you can um how you how you balance that against the productivity targets is the uh is the challenge and that's that your personal resilience as well i suppose um i don't know how much of that is possible yeah it is and we've got time where i can say i've got an open door if anybody wants to just come and have a chat there's people that i know wouldn't come to me but might want to talk that i can go to them and say i'm having a couple of you fancy coming and joining me let's go sit outside and it's, it's nice let's sit outside and have a cuppa and a chat rather than it being come to my office let's have a formal sit down and i know there's guys that would prefer to maybe chat together mm -hmm. so that's not a problem um and i suppose with the workload what i don't want to do is the guys that have just kind of gone yeah he's fine he's in hospital i don't want to pile all joe's work on them because it may catch up with them in a couple of days and they might go oh that's something and they feel that they're being put on more so that's that's the issue is finding that that balance with workload it is, it is a balance yeah and for me it's my personal take on this i would always come back to we can keep the get the people in the right place make sure they're okay they should then carry on with their own workload yeah you can't suddenly load all joe's work onto them but they they'll probably be in an understanding place at that some point and go actually yeah clear i can i can pick up 10 percent of joe's work i've got a bit of capacity here rather than going in tomorrow and going right you've got 10 percent of your work you've got 50 percent of your work just crack on all of you i don't care what you think how you feel you know yeah. I, I wouldn't condone that approach. I would go down the more that in the moment, are you all right? Is everybody okay? And yeah. the trick to that, and I always talk to me about it, the trick to that is if you ask someone if they're okay, just take the time to listen, listen to yeah. the answer. Because again, the, the water cooler conversation is, oh, okay, you all right? Yeah, I'm fine, Steve. You go, okay, thanks, make me coffee and I'm off. Yeah. Um, it's the, it's, it's, you know, I'm not going to analyze going, are you sure you're okay, Claire? But it's about understanding your team and picking up on the emotional cues to go, Claire, don't see myself today. I'm going to, I am going to have that open door. Go, I'm just going for a walk in the shop. Anybody want to come? There are opportunities in the day to do that informal conversation and there'll be opportunities to do the more formal stuff. Mm. Um, but comes from you being in the right place yourself. Yeah. Right, resilient place yourself. Yeah. I think maybe the workload might be, it might be easier to do right let's all get together let's look at what's outstanding who's got what where who can manage with what they're doing and who could pick up something because there might be somebody in the team that's struggling with all their own work and then adding dealing with joe on top has is pushing them so it's realizing who needs who needs support with their own stuff as well as who can pick up what somebody else is doing because there might be somebody that says well actually i'm really struggling to get this presentation written Somebody else said, oh, I can do that. That's no trouble. So if they take that, then they might be able to take something that they can do with yeah. ease. Yeah. And, and I would suggest, importantly, regular updates to the team on how Joe's doing. Yeah. Because they'll be in this craving information stage where they want to know. They, they want to know, but they don't really want to know, but they do want to know. And it's saying, that, you know, if every, anybody wants an update on Joe, I've got it. Or you could broadcast it to the office. It's one or the other, but they will crave information. Yeah. Because of their own guilt, they'll be feeling guilty themselves and they need something to make them feel, oh, he's all right. He's just had a, you know, he's just had a bit of a bit of an episode. He, he'll be all right in a few days. So it's balancing the amount of information you give them to to sort of placate them and keep them mm -hmm. on track against showing that we don't really care about Joe, which I know you do, but it's easy yeah. to show we don't care because I'm not telling you anything about it. So there's there's a balance here of 
of everything going on. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's just checking in on people when the opportunity arises, checking in on yourself, that self-inventory yourself. Who have you got to talk to about this other than me? Have you got someone else that you can talk to? And it will slowly work itself out. And accepting three, four, five days, this will take as a minimum of people going, oh, you remember when, do you remember last week when Joe fell over and hit his head on the desk? You know, that's such a, it's such an abnormal episode, except it will take a few days. Yeah. And somebody, people might not want to sit at his desk for a while. It's perfectly mm. normal. Avoidance of, of the situation is perfectly normal. Yeah. If they're still doing it in 12 months' time, it's a bit of an issue. Mm-hmm. Two or three days, a couple of weeks, you go, okay, I get that. That's a normal thing. Um, so I don't know if that's sort of helped a little bit point you in the right direction. Yeah. So how long would you say, obviously it's very difficult to put a number on it. How long would you say it's normal for people to react differently how long would you expect people to return to to some level of yeah so yeah every everyone's different i would say a good three or four days particularly in your work because this is such an abnormal event Mm. you know three or four days as a minimum people will be talking about it thinking about it asking questions you yourself it might take that length of time even a couple of weeks but if people are still coming into work and they still seem okay they'll still have some underlying you know a bit of butterflies about stuff if that starts to turn into three, four weeks, I'd be considering that we need to get these people some sort of occupational health support, point them to their GP, you know, any kind of, you know, any kind of advice lines they can. Then it becomes out of our world of management and emotional intelligence. It gets to people might need to go, go and speak to somebody. And yeah. then for me, that's all right. There will be somebody who might be affected by it. Go, do you know what? I think, have you considered going to see Hockey Elf? And, and it's how, how you broach that subject is challenging because they might go, what are you on about? There's nothing wrong with me. I'm bloody okay. You go, well, yeah, you're probably not. I can't, mm. I can't help you with that conversation because you don't know how they're going to react. But a couple of weeks, I would expect that is a as normal reaction because it's so abnormal to your situation. Mm-hmm. Three, four weeks, any longer, people want to think about, oh, I'm just going to go and talk to someone about this because it's a traumatic reaction and it's, it's not what they're used to. And then, so if, as and when, if Joe does return back to work, would you expect people to kind of relapse, but almost regress with how, because it's a reminder, because he's back in the office, he's back there. Would you expect people yeah, to... Yeah, I've seen this in the drama world, the, the trigger events, you know, seeing Joe sat back at his desk, people might go, oh, I hope he's not going to stand up and fall over and smash his head again. They will, there will be trigger events, they'll think about it the first time they see joe it might be awkward if he comes back then you've got the let's say you know heaven forbid he doesn't come back to work so yeah the people might regress not to the point of the original trauma but they might suddenly go, oh i'm a bit nervous about tomorrow joe's coming back in that's a normal reaction we all yeah. would be you yourself probably will be if joe comes back in two weeks time you'd be like yeah i don't want to give him too much on his first day but i don't want to single him out by giving him nothing so it's yeah. a it's going to be a a balancing act and people will react again differently. You know, the two guys yeah. you said who don't, they're, they're fine about it. They'll probably be like, oh, I like Joe. You know, they'll be, might be ribbing him about the work he hasn't done for two weeks. Yeah. It's going to be managing and understanding your team individually to go, I just need to think about how we manage this. And managing yeah. upwards, managing your managers is always the challenging one. Yeah. And I suppose it'd be a case of having a chat with the team before he came back to say, right, he's coming back. How does everybody feel? Yeah. Um, anybody got any questions anybody want to know anything because obviously by then I'd have known a bit more about what treatment he's had what help he's had what support he's had and what he needs to be able to relay that back to the team and then hopefully be able to put to spot who might be having have an issue at that point before he comes back yeah and we don't know you know Joe might come back on a phased return and only be doing 50% of his duties and then you've got the rest of the team still picking up his work so yeah it's a it's, a, it's an understanding manager phase then to go, look, we know he's coming back. As you say, tell the team, Joe's coming back. You know, we may have to treat him differently because of this. Or actually, he said, just treat me as normal and I'll still make the tea and still take the mickey out of me. It's, it's, it's understanding the communication becomes the key then for me. Yeah. Telling everybody everything that you can within the bounds of confidentiality to go, well, he's coming back. This is what he's going to be doing. He's asked me not to talk about the other stuff. Treat yeah. him as normal. Uh, and then building that team ethos again for when Joe comes back. 
The yeah. flip side of that is if Joe doesn't come back, how do we deal with that? And that's a that's a different thing altogether. But it's something we can, you know, we can meet again and chat about that again if necessary. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It's keeping the team informed about updates on him, when he's coming back, who's going to be doing what and, and why. Um and it, this is this won't go away quickly, won't go away in a couple of days. Unless yeah. Joe suddenly comes back and says he just had a I just had a mad one and fell over and banged my head. But you know, it's it will evolve every single day. Yeah. And people might come in and be fine today and come in tomorrow and not be fine. Except yeah. that it just happens. Sometimes people who have had a bad day at home and they come in and they go, they see Joe's empty desk and they're in floods of tears. They go, Oh, I don't, I don't know what it's all about. Go, all right, let's have a let's have a coffee, sit down. What's, yeah. going, what's going on because they'll all have their own life traumas going on as well which we've got to accept yeah. and understand and you know joe falling over and cracking his head up and going to hospital might not might have just been the straw that broke the camel back of the person that's had six months of their own personal dramas going on yeah um so you might go into conversation going are you all right about the joe thing and they go yeah i'm fine about that but actually yeah i've been oh. going through a divorce for six months and i'm not very well yeah. So it's again having that in your armory of where, where can I refer this person to? How can I not not get too deep into this that it creates clearer trauma at the same time? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Hope that's helped. Yes. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. You know where I am. Yes. <laughs> Jeremy coming back. Role, role, role play done. Um, and that was really interesting you know, for you guys to work together, just to put into practice what um, you discussed in the first sort of 50 odd minutes, Steve, in, in theory. Um, I haven't seen any questions come in. Claire, have you got anything there at all? You're on mute, my dear. <laughs> Sorry, no, my chat box, chat Q&A box pops up differently and I can't get back to the screen. No, there's nothing, I've not seen anything else come in. Yeah, I'll tell you what, if I had a pound for every time I said you're on mute, I, I wouldn't be here. I'd, exactly. I'd, be selling my, I'd be selling myself in the Caribbean. Um, not allowed in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, look, we're well ahead of schedule. It's, it's, it's 25 to 12. Um, there's no point just dragging it out for 25 minutes. Just, just to, I'd rather say that, you know, because I always give two hours, but sometimes we come within that two hours, but we never go over. Um, we've come well within, um, so let, let's leave it there for today with regards to questions, role practice and sort of the educational side of things. Steve, you've been incredible. I know we've had some uh, questions come up about people being able to get in contact with you so I yep. can make those introductions. Um, the session's being recorded so people can have a copy of this recording, which they can obviously use the, as a future reference point. But, you know, that, that's, that's it from us. Thank you so much for being here, Steve, and giving up your time. And, and Claire, thanks for, for all practising through a couple of scenarios. Yeah, no, thank you. Been that's brilliant. I, I just add at the end, you know, <clears throat> hopefully, hopefully it came across that that wasn't the first time I'd done that, but essentially it was. So if people think there was something missing, you know, we, you know, we, uh, myself, Jeremy and Claire, we're all about if there's something that was missing that you think I can add in, um, then ask and I'll, I can tweak it and we can have chats about it because this is about developing it to something that really fits your corporate world. Some of the questions are really encouraging, but happy to add stuff in, take stuff out. You know, if you think Steve's mad, tell him and we'll figure it out. Absolutely. I think today was always just going to be a generic, you know, sweep brush, sweeping brush because, you know, you can't possibly um, understand the delegates that we've got here today what their issues are in their business and they could be they could be any kinds of issues and situations not necessarily negative or traumatic they could actually be really positive yeah. um it's like a lot of things what goes up comes down so where there's a positive there's a positive there's always going to be a negative and vice versa so resilience and mental health is something that claire and i champion um so it's great to have you here as a guest um keynote uh speaker so once again Steve, thank you. Thanks, Claire. And, and thank you um, as delegates for being here. It's uh, great you've given up your morning to uh, to be part of the session. So thank you very much. Yep. Thanks all. Take care. Thank Take you. care now. Bye bye. Thank bye. you.